Well, hello, and welcome back to Adrian's Digital Basement. On today's video, it's another midweek mini mail call. We're up to number 27, which is still hard to believe. I just can't believe the generosity of everyone who is donating stuff to me. So thank you very much to all the viewers who have sent stuff in, and thank you to the viewers who sent stuff in for this video. So on today's video, we'll just have a hodgepodge of interesting stuff, including a bunch of candy. So let's get right to it. All right, we have a little miniature package here. This one comes from Andreas in Taiwan. Hi to all my viewers in Taiwan. I have never received a package all the way from Taiwan before. I'm thinking other than, of course, China when I order stuff from there all the time. Have I ever received a mail call item from anywhere else in Asia? I'm not sure that I have, but anyhow, cool. Okay, what's in here? It's just a small little box. Okay, that was a false alarm. Uh, this didn't come from a viewer in Taiwan. It came from another viewer, Robert, who ordered something for me that got shipped from Taiwan. So if you're a viewer and you're in Taiwan, put a comment in the comment section below. I'd love to hear from some of my Taiwanese viewers if I have any. So apparently in here is an Amiga floppy adapter, the mini version. The smaller version of this adapter is intended for direct attachment to the rear of the floppy drive. It can make a standard PC floppy drive work on an Amiga computer as a double density drive. The device will work with any classic Amiga, Amiga 500, 1000, 600, 1200, 2000, 4000, 3000, etc. Basically everything. Most game and demo discs will work fine with no special software or drivers required. So that's fascinating. I didn't even know you could do this outside of the disk drive. So the reason why like a regular PC disk drive doesn't immediately work on an Amiga is there's just a couple extra signals that the Amiga disk drives send through to the Amiga that PC disk drives normally aren't configured to send. And one of them is the disk change. If I recall, one of them is the disk change status. There's a line, I think pin 34, that if you pop the disk out and put a new one in, it tells the computer that a disk has been inserted. So it knows right away. Well, PCs don't really have a way to detect if the disk is in there or not, right? It just tries and then will give you an error and says, you know, can't be found or whatever. So on some regular PC three and a half inch disk drives, like I have a TAC that actually have it in Amiga right now, that's a regular high density drive from a PC, has some configuration jumpers on it. And there were some jumpers I could move around based on the service manual to send the right signals that the Amiga needs through and it made it work. Well, this little board here, which has power that goes into it, has a few LEDs, a couple jumpers. I guess this emulates somehow that functionality and gives the Amiga the signal it needs from a regular PC drive without actually having a drive that sends the right signals. That's fascinating. On the paper here, it talks about a couple jumper settings that are available to you. So you can, there's a couple settings for the ready signal, which is one of the things the Amiga uses. There's a disk change signal. There's the hardware drive selects, that's DS0 and DS1. And that's actually right. A lot of PC disk drives are just permanently fixed at DS1. That's like the second drive in, in a sugar disk drive system. And that's because the PCs use that twist in the cable to identify which drive is which. And when you have the twist, like on any normal PC, you always set every drive to drive select one. Something like the Tandy 1000, on the other hand, doesn't use the twist. So you need to have drives that have the little jumpers on them and not all of them do. So all this does is it routes the signal that would come over the drive select zero into drive select one so that your PC floppy drive can support it. Although I have some three and a half inch drives I and mean, a good number of them actually that do have that one jumper on them that allow you to select between drive select zero and one. It does say on the back here that some disk drives will not be suitable due to the location of the connectors on the back. Like if you have to put this in, it's overlapping with something else. So he says that it's not suitable due to connection layout is like a Sony disk drive. Working with a cable extension is some Panasonic and then totally working are a Panasonic and TAC drive. So cool. Let's take a look at this on the bench. Before we take a look at the floppy drive adapter that Robert sent in, I'm going to be testing it on this Amiga 2000, which is the one I fixed the battery leakage on. And it's been, what, a couple months since I've worked on this. At least a couple months. I, maybe it's been more than that. I want to see if this thing still works. Maybe it has 
died again because of the battery leakage I didn't completely clean up. Who knows, right? Let's just try it out. I've got the little TV plugged into the composite output, so that's a black and white output, but let's see what happens when we turn on the machine. Oh, hey, look. Seems to be working, maybe. Let's see if it actually boots. All right, there we go, Kickstart 2.0. It's actually working, and I think the accelerator is in this computer, which is the one that had the battery damage right on it. Let me boot up the Amiga test kit just to see if this thing is definitely working. I think the floppy drives work in this. I don't really remember. I didn't fully restore this machine. Well, that didn't boot. Okay, so it seems like the drive on the right wasn't able to boot the disk, but the one on the left had no problem at all. And I know you won't be able to see this on the camera, but it does say 68030. That means the accelerator card that's in this thing is working a yeah, total of nine megabytes. So that's cool to know that this thing is working, but yeah, this floppy drive is not working. Just as a really quick fix and experiment, I'm going to use this cleaning disk with the cleaning solution here on this disk drive on the right. See if this makes this thing read that disk properly or not. Turn the machine on that in. Come on, Amiga, try to boot. There we go. We'll just do that one more time. Okay, let's see if this test kit floppy is working better now. And it is not. It did not boot that, that disk in there, even after the cleaning disk. And this drive is working. So, okay, I know that I need to try to do repair on this. That'll be for a different video. Taking a look inside this machine, it's definitely seen better days. It's a little bit of rust and stuff going on in here. I do, taking a look inside this machine, it's just as I left it. So the Amiga Commodore Accelerator is right in here. SCSI card, doesn't have any RAM on it. And two different RAM cards that total up to eight megabytes, including the memory that's on the accelerator right here. With regards to the floppy drives, it's this one on the right that isn't working, and there's little telltale signs, a bit of a rust coming off the edge right here. So this whole machine was exposed to quite a lot of water or moisture, especially as the RF shield that's underneath the motherboard and goes around the ports on the front and the back, it was all rusty. This is the RF shield from this machine, and I actually need to put it back in. And it's all black here because I've sprayed it with rust converter. Along the front and the back edges, there was a ton of rust but I sanded it down a little bit and then sprayed it. So that should stop all future rusting. And I can put this thing back in. It's not gonna be super effective as an RF shield, but it adds a little bit of uh, stability and strength to the front and the back ports because they actually screw into these, into this metal right here. Anyhow, we're actually here to talk about this floppy drive adapter that Robert sent me. Now, unfortunately, even though this cable here that plugs into the disk drive looks like it should work on a PC floppy drive, it's electrically very, very similar but there are some signals that are slightly different between this disk drive and a standard PC style floppy drive. And this is a 1.44 meg one I found at I think the thrift store for a couple dollars. It's got a compact badge on it, but it's actually made by Panasonic and it's just a standard 1.44 megabyte drive. But this drive doesn't have any jumpers on it. So that means a couple things. It is fixed for drive select one. So that's one problem is you can't change this to drive select zero, which the Amiga does use drive select one and zero. But as I had mentioned, there are some other differences in the signaling and specifically it's the ready signal and the disc change signal. So I'm just gonna unplug both of these drives and let's plug in this cable into this floppy drive here. Let's just see what happens if we try to use this drive in the Amiga without this adapter connected to it. All right, TV's on, let's turn this on and let's take the Amiga test kit disc I'll stick it in this disk drive here. All right, well, <laughs> okay, it just worked. Um, that was unexpected. <laughs> I didn't think it would actually work, but it did. Um, but I think one of the problems is when I take the disk out, the Amiga doesn't know that I've removed it. It's gonna think it's still in there. Like I had said, the signaling on the PC disk drives is very similar to the Amiga one, but it's just not fully compatible. <laughs> but I guess it's enough for it to, to boot up. Let me boot an actual Amiga Workbench disk so we can see what I mean about the drive select affecting 
it and not making it not detect when you pull the disk out. That's, I think, what the problem is gonna be. All right, so the computer is ready for me to boot. I'm gonna put this workbench disk in here. And as you see, nothing's happening. It's not even detecting that I stuck the disk in there. And that's one of the problems right there. Now, if I power cycle the computer, it will boot off this, but the Amiga is just unable to tell when I stick a disk in here. And that's the main problem because the Amiga definitely relies on that disk change signal for you to be able to swap disks and for it to know there's a drive or disk in there or you pulled the disk out. So with the adapter, I simply just connect it onto the disk drive, onto the cable connection as is normal. And then it has a cable that comes out of it here. And this is for plugging into the disk drive, power cable connector, that is. And then there's a pin header right here. And that is for plugging the Amiga's power connector onto there. Now it's not keyed, so you gotta make sure you don't screw it up and plug it in the wrong way. And at least on my Amiga, the yellow cable on here is five volts and the orange is 12. But you better check it first with a multimeter before you go connecting it up. There is a jumper on the adapter board to let me select between drive zero and one on the Amiga. So you just wanna set that appropriately depending on where you have it on the cable. And honestly, I don't quite remember on the Amiga is the connector with the twist drive zero or drive one. So I don't quite remember. So I'm just gonna plug this in as it is on the with the twist and it's set for drive zero right now. Let's see what happens. Okay, no smoke came out. That's a good sign. All right, so it's ready for me to stick a disc in. And remember that before I put this adapter on, when it got to this point, if I put the disc in there, it wouldn't do anything because it couldn't sense that there was no disc in the drive. Let's see what happens. Hey, look at that. That's a win. And it booted right up. So this adapter, it works a treat. It's fantastic. And of course these PC type drives are super plentiful and very common, much easier to get than these Amiga disk drives. So if you are trying to replace your disk drive in an Amiga and you have access to very inexpensive PC style 1.44 drives, this adapter is perfect. Now, unfortunately, one thing this will not solve is the fact that PC style disk drives are not nearly as tall as Amiga disk drives. So if you mount it in the case, you're gonna end up with pretty sizable gap. And I'm sorry, the black faceplate's probably not super easy to see that problem, but it actually absolutely is a problem. You could use little standoffs to raise it up, but you're still gonna have this somewhat sizable gap under your disk drive. But if it's the difference between having no working disk drive, say like an Amiga 500 or something like that, and one that actually can read disks, then this is an absolutely great solution. So thank you very much, Robert, for sending me one of these adapters. And I suppose if you're looking to get one yourself, look on eBay for Amiga floppy drive adapter mini version. And I think you'll get one of these. All right, so we have a package here that's pretty heavy. This comes from Vince in Bend, Oregon. So not too far from Portland here. When people think of Oregon, they often think of Portland and they say, oh, it's so rainy there and whatever. But Bend actually is in the high desert terrain. So it's really not rainy there. It's very, very sunny. It's a bit colder than here in the winter because it is the high desert. So it gets cold, but it's a lot of sun. I've been to Bend several times and it's a really cute city. I think they're growing really quickly because there's a lot of tech people moving there from the Bay Area and from California, but also people from Portland move there when they can't handle the gray weather any longer for the winters. They wanna to go to crisp and sunny places, but still be inside Oregon. Personally, I actually love the weather here in the winter. It's, it's damp and mossy, and it makes everything so green and luscious and beautiful in the springtime. But anyways, and it's not for everyone, right? Okay, so we have a note here. It goes, hey, Adrian, I've been an avid viewer of your channel since late last year. Since then, it has easily become one of my favorite retro computing slash candy review channels. Keep the awesome videos coming. While I don't have any retro gear to send your way, I figured I could give your pancreas a workout. I've enclosed a cornucopia, my favorite word, of Haribo gummy candies. Maybe there is one or two that you haven't tried. The gold bears are made in Germany, so it seems they make the American version there too. And that's right, I did post some pictures on my Twitter. I was recently at the supermarket just here by my house, and I found Haribos from Germany, Brazil, Spain, Turkey, UK, and there might've been one more country. <laughs> so clearly the stuff we get here is not always made in Turkey. They come from all over. 
He goes on to write, I'm curious to know what type are in the passport mix, which I guess is something that's in here. I've also included some Albanese gummy bears and would be curious how they compare to the Harry Bows. Thanks very much, Vince from Bend, Oregon. Awesome, okay, well, let's see what he sent me. <laughs> he sent me a massive bag of Harry Bow Sours, which I really like. These are made in Germany. And then we have a big ass bag of Harry Bow Gold Bears, and those are also made in Germany. Oh, here's something I have not seen before Harry Bow Sour Bite Zings. And these ones are made in Spain. And these ones I have seen but never tried the Harry Bow Berries. These are made in Turkey. And then we have some Haribo dinosaurs, also made in Turkey. Oh, we got some of my favorites. These are twin snakes. And these are from Germany. I love twin snakes. What I like about them is uh, there's two little snakes, half of it's sour, half of it's sweet, and you gotta eat them little by little, get a little bit of both worlds there. All right, this is what he was talking about, the Haribo passport mix. I can't say I've ever tried these. If you see at the top here, there's some little flags over the candies. I'm not sure that picks it up on the camera, but there's German flag, UK flag. I see an Italian flag. I think a Spanish flag is there. Cool, those are made in Germany. Here's another one I've never tried before. Haribo Smurfs, made in Turkey. Yeah, obviously whatever store Vince went to has a better selection than the store by my house. Whoops, that just fell over. I go to a store here called Fred Meyer. It's just the closest big supermarket to my house and they have an okay selection, but they don't have a lot of these. All right, here's another one. Haribo Fizzy Colas. These are made in Brazil. So I really like the Haribo Colas. It's sort of like a cola flavored candy, but these ones say that they're sour and tangy, which I like the sound of. All right, here's Haribo Sour Vampires. Now this is a Halloween specific one made in Germany. I did buy a packet of these at the store for Halloween and I've already eaten them. And then here's one. This is Haribo Happy Cherries. These are made in the UK. Gotta say, I like those. Ah, oh, this is great. These are the Haribo Star Mix. So this is the US version of the Star Mix. It doesn't have the white milk type ones in it. And this packet, by the way, is made in Turkey. Oh, and here we go. This is the regular Haribo Happy Coal I was talking about. These are made in Brazil, and these are delicious. I do buy these periodically because I love those. Ah, so these are the Albanese ones he was talking about. Fat-free, gluten-free, low sodium. It looks like this company is based out of Marysville, Indiana, here in the US. And it says, sour 12 flavor gummy bears. Can't say I've ever tried those. And one final little packet Harry Bow round candies. Hopefully that's focusing on the candy and not my face. Oh, I did just go look upstairs to see what I had. And I had some Happy Colas, which are made in Brazil, which seem to match the ones that Vince just sent me. I also have something that Vince didn't send. Um, oh yeah, because he sent Star Mix, right? I had these, which are Scare Mix. And it's basically Star Mix, but they've mixed up the flavors specifically for Halloween. It says with spooky flavors inside. And this said it was made in Germany as well, which uh, these Star Mix were made in Turkey. So it just sort of shows that we get the Haribo actually from all over the world. It just seemed like every time I was showing the US version, they were the ones made in Turkey. And yet, if you just look here, we have a whole assortment of countries, UK and Spain and Brazil and, Okay, so I think I'm gonna try out the flavors that I haven't tried before, which is specifically these ones. Now I do have to mention, uh, people who are curious, the German gold bears that they sell in the US taste exactly the same as the ones from Turkey, at least, at least from what I can tell. They don't taste anything like the ones that actually are made in Germany for the German markets, the ones that viewers have sent in. I haven't tried ones made for other European markets like England and other countries like that, I can definitely say now that because I've been paying attention to where they're made, that everything that seems to be made for Haribo of America seems to taste the same no matter what country it actually originates from. I also compared the ingredients list of some that were made in Turkey compared to ones that were made in Germany that were sold here, and they both have identical ingredients lists. So I really don't think there's any kind of difference at all. They seem to be specifically tailored for US tastes, as far as I can tell at least. 
All right, well, let's start out with these Sour Bites here. It does say that they're two flavors in one and they have a big zing to them. Okay, it just looks like a piece of licorice, to be honest, but with um, citric acid coating, so the sour gives that sour taste. The flavor is definitely sharp and yet sugary, but also has the citric acid kind of zing to it going on. It does say it has uh, four flavors, strawberry lemon, which I think is the one I just ate, lime and lemon, blue raspberry, red raspberry, and watermelon and red raspberry. Okay. Clearly 100% artificial flavor going on on these. Um, I definitely like these. <laughs> Those will be all consumed eventually. Okay, next up, let's try out the Smurfs. I do have to admit, when I was a kid, I really loved the cartoon of Smurfs. And I'm talking in the 80s. I watched the heck out of that. Okay, so they are sort of like gummy bears that look like Smurfs. In fact, uh, they're blue and white. And I see the odd one that's blue and red, which if everyone who remembers their Smurfs is Papa Smurf. Papa Smurf wears a red hat. Everyone else wears a white hat. I really have to wonder what kind of flavor these are. And I have to wonder, are they double flavor? Like is the white part a different flavor than the blue? Don't know what to say about those. It's a gummy candy. It's sweet. The flavor is non-distinct. Can't really tell what it is. It says it has natural and artificial fruit flavor. Can't really tell what the flavor is. And it doesn't say, unless I cut it off the top already. But um, yeah, would I buy these again? Probably not. I really do prefer stuff like this, where you have a variety of flavors in there. It's not just the same. Although that does go against what I said about the Happy Cola, because the entire bag of this tastes the same. <laughs> but I only eat a few of these at a time, which I guess would be the same with these, but these have a more enjoyable flavor that really do taste like cola. This just tastes like a gummy candy. So yeah, not great, but not bad. All right, next up is the Passport Mix. And it does say right here on the top, anniversary edition, 100 years of Haribo. I don't think they've been selling in the US for that long, but I am sure in Germany. All right, so this definitely looks more like the European stuff. So this looks like a little, maybe a crocodile or an alligator, and it's got the white milk stuff on the back. Mmm, yeah, that was pretty tasty. I just spit off a part of it. Uh, this looks like a little piece of licorice, similar to these um, zinger thingies, except instead of it being filled with a fruit flavor on the inside, it's filled with that white milk stuff. Oh, those are weird. The, the texture is kind of hard, harder than I expected. It's definitely that same milk stuff, which I kind of like. <laughs> After everyone's been sending me the candy in, I've now really started to like that milk stuff. Here's a regular gold bear. And um, so that's interesting. That gold bear has the same texture as the German ones that are sold in Germany. Less soft than the US ones, a little bit more chewy, and the flavor is less intense in the color. So I assume what they did is they just added some gold bears in here from the ones they sell in Germany. This entire package, by the way, is made in Germany. And there's one more that looks really weird. It's um, kind of like a cube. Yeah, and it looks like it's got the white stuff inside and it's not, it's hard. Um, interesting. I kind of like it though, it's different. Looks like on the back here, it has a Spanish flag stuck in there. So they like this in Spain. And um, yeah, I really like that piece of candy. It has sort of an orange flavor to it. And then the white part has that milk texture in it, that whatever, the, <laughs> the white stuff. I don't even know what it's called. There was a German word for it on the German package, milk something or other. I would screw it up if I tried to say it. But um, that is a pretty tasty piece of candy. I would love a whole bag of those actually, if I could get my, my hands on it. So. These are great. I recommend Passport Mix. If you live in the US and you see these on the store, grab them. Because it's a nice different set of Haribo that you wouldn't normally get here in the US. And I'm gonna eat this bag slowly. I wanna savor them. All right, next up is the Fizzy Colas. So I assume it's just like the Happy Colas, but with the citric acid uh, zing added to them. Let's take a look. I wonder if they've added any of that fizzing candy as well, the stuff that makes your tongue tingle when you eat it. Mm. 
No, not really. It's almost like the Happy Cola and they just coated it with sugar and a little bit of a citric acid. So there's a slight, slight pucker zing going on. I don't really get the fizzy part of it other than the granulated sugar that kind of crunches in your teeth. So not bad, I like. Do I like them more than the regular Happy Colas? Hard to say, they're good, but I like Happy Cola a lot. All right, and the next one are the berries. I've seen these in the stores. And I've never bought them, and they just, I'm not quite gonna, I'm not sure. I'm already feeling unsure about these. Okay. All right, so right off the bat, um, it's gonna be hard to see on the camera. It looks a lot like an actual blackberry or a raspberry. This is obviously like a blackberry. It's made up of little balls, and I just ate one of them because one had fell on the desk and it was sort of a crunchy texture. So I, these aren't soft. Oh, well, they're sort of soft. I can squish it. Interesting. I gotta say that's kind of interesting. It says here, crunchy and chewy, and that's kind of what it is. It's crunchy and chewy at the same time. It's really, really sweet. There's so much sugar in those, like just one of them. It's, it tastes a lot sweeter than all of these other ones. These are made in Turkey, just incidentally. And um, yeah, I mean, it really did taste like a berry. I mean, it's artificial, but it has that berry flavor. Like that tastes sort of like a blackberry. And I assume the red ones, let me just try one of the red ones. I won't eat a whole one because it's, it's so sweet. Oh, I see, biting into it. The center is like a gummy candy. And then the outside of these little balls, which are kind of crunchy and sugary, Actually, the red one tasted less like a berry than the purple ones, or black, or whatever color those are. But it, yeah, I like them, not, not the best. All right, and then last up, we have these Albanese, if, if that's how you pronounce it. World's best, they're claiming, made in the USA. Okay, well, it smells good. Um, let's see, oh, they're very, very, very soft. They are, these are bears, but they're bigger than the Haribo Gold Bears. Very soft, though. So on the front of the bag, it says, starts sour, stays sour. And yeah, actually, they're not overly sweet. It's not as soft as Turkish Delight, but it's not that different either. Turkish Delight is very, very soft, right? It reminds me a little bit of that texture, though. It's just a little more gelatinous, a little holds together a little more. But it is definitely sour. It's not sweet. If you eat these Haribos here, the ones that say sour on them, they start sour, but then they end up, they end up sweet which is fine, that's a good combination. It kind of transitions. These ones, these ones stay sour all the time. I like them. Let's just do a quick comparison of the nutritional information. I wanna see how much carbohydrates is in both. Okay, so, so in the Albanese, 30 grams is one serving size, and that comes out to 22 grams of carbohydrates. And on the Haribos, the serving size is 31 grams. Now, 12 pieces. Now on this one here, by the way, it's eight pieces. So it shows you how much bigger these are. So on the Haribo, 12 pieces is 31 grams, so slightly more, but total carbohydrates is 24 grams. So you're eating one more gram of candy and you're only getting one extra gram of carbohydrates versus these. So in other words, there really is not much difference from a sugar content. They're both extremely sugary. But these do taste more sour overall. I guess they just have more of that citric acid mixed in to the actual gummy bear. It's probably not citric acid. People are probably screaming at their screen telling me what actually makes it sour, but it's something like that, right? But anyhow, I do like these. They're pretty good. If I had to pick, I don't think I could pick. I think there's room in the world for both kinds of sour gummy bears. So thank you very much, Vince, for sending in all this candy. And I hope people don't mind that I take tangents off onto candy reviews sometimes. All right, next up. We have a package here. Can't quite make out the name, but it's from Georgetown, Texas. Hello to all my Texas viewers. I received this package on the 30th of October. So just a few days ago, something wrapped in aluminum foil here. Okay, so we have no letter here. All right, let's see, is this candy? Or what is this in here? What's in here? Okay, we got some old chips. Either Ram chips or 74LS Logic. Look at this bundle of chips here. 
That's gotta be what's in this one too. And it's heavy. Ah, yes, okay, I remember now. So this gentleman had a bunch of tubes of ICs, including a whole ton of EEPROMs. He said he didn't need any of that stuff anymore and if I'd like it, I, I of course said sure, because these old EEPROMs are fantastic to get. Now these tubes are long and expensive to ship, so I just told him to take everything out, stack it up, wrap it up in aluminum foil, throw it in a priority mailbox, which is what he did, and send it my way. But yeah, that just looks like a ton of EEPROMs, including some 40 pin dip EEPROMs. It's kind of interesting. So uh, yeah, let's take a look at this stuff on the bench. The stash of all stashes of EEPROMs. Okay, it's not the stash of all stashes, but this is a really, really nice selection here. There's a lot of chips here. So let me just do a quick sort just to see generally what type of EEPROMs these are. Well, a quick sort later, and basically all of the EEPROMs are 27, 256s, which are great because that's a really common size that's used on a lot of things. And it seems like these are probably from PC BIOSes because there's odd and even, so it says Stan BIOS, whatever that is, Stan AT. And then these are from GVP, Grass Valley Products. Wasn't that the company that made accelerators for the Amiga? I think I had a GVP 68030 in my Amiga at some point. Was that GVP the same GVP as this? This one's a Phoenix BIOS, there's just one, there's a missing one, DTK erased. Yeah, just, but every single one of these is 27256s, which is amazing. And incidentally, I will need to erase these. Um, if anyone thinks I need to copy some of these ROMs, let me know. Um, but basically everything is either this GVP ROM you see here or some of this Stan BIOS stuff. All of these are either one of those two. But anyway, I'll need to get these labels off so I can erase them in the EEPROM eraser. And I will take these and put them face down with a little WD-40 soaked on it, like on a piece of plastic. And I'll just leave it there for day, a day or two. And once you do that, when you flip it back over, the label will just fall off. You just push it off with your finger and it just comes off. And then you just have to wash off the WD-40 with, say, something like Simple Green. And um, then it makes these really nice, clean EEPROMs that I can then erase and put back into stock to be used up in the future. Now, uh, this with this amount of these, I'll probably never, ever need to buy more of these ever again. I had been buying these particular types of chips from AliExpress just because they were so inexpensive there. So if I got fake ones, I could throw them away and it was no real loss. But generally, I found the AliExpress ones worked. But this is nice because these are mostly Intel and Toshiba chips. They're a name brand. It'll be fantastic. This, like I said, this will be great in my stock. As for these little dip ICs here, these all appear to be dual precision, retriggerable, resettable, mono stable, multi vibrators. Yeah, interesting. I'm not quite sure where I would use these, but it's probably useful to have. I'll never know when I need a, one of these <laughs> in a circuit. So I'll be popping these into my stock of chips. So thank you very much, Chris, for sending me all these chips. I really appreciate it. Okay. So we have a package from Montreal, city I was born in. This comes from Francois. Hello to all my viewers in Montreal, both French Canadian ones and the Anglos. And yes, that's right. So even though I was born in Montreal, uh, my family is actually all English speaking. I'm not French Canadian. Although my brothers and sisters, which are actually my half brothers and sisters, they have French Canadian parents. So they are fully bilingual. My French skills aren't so great anymore. We always spoke English at home and I mostly went to English schools. So my French is not great. And it's also why I don't have any kind of a French accent. Not to mention I've lived in the US a long time. So my accent that I might've had is completely worn off by now anyhow. All right, so Francois sent a note. He says, hi Adrian, as a fellow YouTuber, I appreciate all the work you do and I know the effort it takes to do what you do. So thank you. You talked about Smarties, so I sent you some from Montreal since you also lived here. Maybe you can tell if they're any different from the ones in the US. Well, uh, Francois, we don't have Smarties in the US. There is candy called Smarties in the US, but they're nothing, nothing like these. The Smarties in Canada are like the Smarties in England, as far as I'm aware. Yeah, these are also Nestle. Now I do remember, and people will have to remind me, Canadians who are also of a similar age to me, but I swear that the Smarties that I got as a kid, the box was longer, it's more rectangular. Like it, 
It wasn't quite the size of two, but maybe it was this big. And I don't think it was as thick either. So it was thinner, it was maybe like that big. I mean, I don't remember exactly because I was just a kid. So my hands were much smaller. I think they were a lot longer and the Smarties logo took up the whole thing. The Smarties they sell in the US are terrible. They're just little round sugar things. They come in a roll, just plastic wrapped and they're very cheap candy. You get them on Halloween and no one likes them. I mean, if if you live in the US and you like the US Smarties <laughs> but you lo or you love the Smarties, please put a comment in the comment section below. I'd love to hear from someone who loves them because pretty much everyone I know <laughs> always thinks they're pretty terrible. And when Canadians go, I love Smarties, people in the US are like, what are you talking about? Why would you love those crap candies? And that's because of course, they don't have these Smarties, they have the junky version. He also included some maple candies for you. He loves them. I'll talk about those in a second. Let me just read the rest of this. And now for the bulk of the package, I have designed on Thingiverse some cartridges for the C64. Since you were talking about 3D printing some for yourself, I tried to do the same, but the models on Thingiverse were hard to print cleanly. So I made up my own and sent four regular cartridges and four with a small hole for the switch. I will have a video on designing those cases on my channel, Frank's 3D Shop. Oh, these look really nice, Francois. Yeah, okay, very cool. Textured and everything. Um, okay, we'll take a look at these in a second on the bench. Let me get back to the candy really quick. So let's check out the Smarties. Now, um, I had those Smarties sent in from a viewer from the UK and they kind of tasted like I remember. Let's just see if the Canadian ones, since I have the UK ones fresh in my mind. Yeah, you know what? These seem a bit bigger and this is kind of what I remember them like like the colors on these are just a little bit darker than the UK ones and they're larger. The physical size is larger. Unfortunately, I've eaten all the ones from the UK so I can't compare them, but let me just taste one. These are exactly how I remember them. And I have to say, they're not the same as the ones from the UK. The UK ones, not only are they physically lighter, the candy coating is a lot thinner. These are much crunchier and then also I mean, I haven't tasted, I've only tasted a couple. Let me try this pink one in here. Oh, that's yellow. <laughs> I don't think these taste different. I think each one of them tastes exactly the same. I keep getting, there we go. There's a pink one. Yes, um, that one didn't taste any different. I think the Canadian ones, they all taste exactly the same. There is no variation in the taste. They're much crunchier and they're much larger than the ones from the UK. Not much larger, but they're larger than the ones from the UK. And Francois, thank you very much. I. I used to buy these all the time. So anytime I had any pocket money that was free, like I had allowance with a little bit of money left over, there was a small convenience store in Montreal I used to go to. So in Montreal, what we call a convenience store is a dépanneur. And there was one on the way home from school. So when I would walk home from school, I'd stop at the dépanneur and use my allowance money to buy Smarties. <laughs> and I always remember sticking my fingers into the box because the box, like I said, was longer. So I was always getting my finger in there and, um, I think after a while it would hurt my hand between my fingers here because as a, my little tiny kid fingers were trying to reach into the box to grab just one at a time so I could savor the candies. And yeah, that some surreal memories there stopping at that dépanneur to get my to get my candy. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's that's them. That's the Smarties. This is what I remember. On the box here it says same amount less packaging. So I guess that's why the the box is smaller and different shape, just less cardboard, I suppose. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. And then here, he sent some maple candies. Huh. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about a bit, little bit of nostalgia now. This is something I remember doing and I remember loving a lot. We would take school field trips in the winter to go out to where they make maple syrup. And in French, it was, cal it was called cabane à sucre. And in English, it was called sugaring off. And literally, if you're Canadian in Quebec and you're like, oh, I'm gonna go sugaring off, everyone knows what that means. And it's, you're gonna go to this farm where they basically have all these maple trees and they're collecting the sap. And they collect it into buckets. And this is how they did it, at least back when I was a kid. And then they pour it into these big, huge vats that warm it up and they distill off a lot of the water content in the sap and it thickens and it becomes maple syrup. And these farms, 
Of course, they make all sorts of things with the maple syrup besides just the normal maple syrup you can buy in a jar to put on your pancakes. They have the candies like this stuff. They have uh, maple butter bars and just all sorts of delicious stuff. And there were, I went multiple times. Like this was just something you did as a kid, as a field trip. You went to go see how the maple syrup was made. And like, I, and I did go to a French school for a few years and yeah, cabane à which is like literally means sugar cabin. And that's the, the shack that's in the woods there where they're distilling the sap down to make maple syrup. And it's just, it's a rite of passage. At least it was for me. I don't know if kids still do that in Canada. I'd love to hear about it. If they do, please comment in the comment section below. And also I, I have a feeling in Northeast US, like in New England, which is exactly the same climate and, and as Quebec, I'm sure they do it as well, but maybe not. Maybe this is purely a Canada thing, but these little candies were something you could get. And let me just try one of these. You could probably buy these in the US. They're gonna be imported from Canada. And let's just see what these are. These are hard candies made with maple syrup. They're very sticky and very sugary and very mapley. Oh yeah, okay, it's gonna take me a little while to eat this. So I'm not gonna do it on camera, but it's got that, that delicious, really concentrated maple flavor. And it's, it's not fake, it's the real thing. It came from a tree, it's, it's so good. So if you ever have a chance to, if you see some of these for sale in a store and they're imported from Canada or from New England in the US, like Vermont or Maine, pick some up, super delicious. All right, so let's take a closer look at these cases on the bench. Well, let's check out these 3D printed cases that Francois set, sent. Now I have to give uh, a forewarning that the candy that he has sent is gone already. <laughs> I'm filming this bench part a little ways after I did the opening and the maple candies and the Smarties, gone. So these cases, they just, they look amazing. They really do. They're printed beautifully. <laughs> Your printer's calibrated really well. I love the texture on the top, space for a label. This is one of the ones that doesn't have space for a switch. There's the screw. The whole thing just looks super nice. Let's take a look at one of the ones with the hole there. Okay, a little bit of ripple from the print head there, but um, that is for the small switch. And yeah, these things completely solid. They just feel wonderful. Now, it was a recent mail call that I got this Super Zaxxon cartridge here, and I wanted to have a case for this because I don't like just having this floating around like that. So one of the ones without the switch should be perfect. And hopefully the screw hole is in exactly the right place. Well, let's give it a try. Let me get the right screwdriver bit to open this. I think there should be a bit in here for this. My little, it had a little nice plastic thing to hold these and it broke. So I'm just keeping these bits in this little case here. And it's a little annoying because sometimes it takes me a little while to find the right thing, the right bit. Oh, there it is, so I found it, but gotta dig through this, a bit of a pain, I gotta say. But I do like this set. It's just, it's not ideal that the plastic holding case broke. <laughs> well, that's pretty nice. He's using a machine screw there to hold this thing together. Okay, all right, so that thing is pretty standard and sure enough, there it goes, right in there. So you pop this in, sticks through just as it should, I guess. Hopefully that is the case. You know, I wanna make sure I have this in the right way. No, that's wrong. This needs to go on that way, look at that. I would have potentially damaged my cartridge. So label side up, so the chips face up that way. Bam, there we go, Super Zaxxon in a cartridge. I love it. Let me use my label printer to make a label. This is like the worst label printer. <laughs> Such a piece of junk. Actually, it's not the fault of the printer so much. It's more that um, I bought this cheap clone tape. It doesn't stick very well onto things, so there's a good chance I'm gonna stick this on and it will just come off with time anyways. Look, it's not even centered. I'm not even sure why it doesn't print centered. That stupid thing. But yeah, sweet. I love it. So I have Super Zax on. Here is my Easy Flash 3 cartridge. These are two that I use pretty regularly. This is my dead test cartridge. And this would probably completely fit inside the case. But the problem is I need access 
to these dip switches. So I suppose if I build this in here, I'm gonna to have to dremel away the case to uh, install this. Definitely the screw hole's in the right spot. I guess I can I can do that. I don't know. Um, I'm not. I'm undecided on that. These cases are too nice. I don't really have many other cartridge boards to put in them though, except for this one. But um, I guess we'll see. There's another cartridge I keep handy. It's the Epix Fast Load cartridge, but of course this is in a case already. I don't need to put this in a new one. So I have these three carts here. And I guess what this means now that I have all these nice cases that Francois sent, I need to buy some PCBs and build up some more fun game cartridges. Just ones I can pop in and play a game really quick. I mean, of course, with the Easy Flash, I can kind of do everything I'd ever need to do in any of these cartridges, but it might be fun if I've hooked up a couple 64 simultaneously to you know have a little play where people can come over and play on them. I'll need to have some extra cartridges. Here are some links to Francois's YouTube channel and also his uh, link to the design of this cartridge. If you'd like to print some of your own, that's where you can download the STL file. I'll put a link in the description to uh, both of these things. So once again, thank you very much, Francois, for saying this stuff in and the candy as well. Very much appreciated and very much gone. Well, that's going to be it for this mail call video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, I'd appreciate a thumbs up. But if you didn't, you know what to do. Hit that subscribe button to subscribe to my channel and the bell icon for notifications when I upload new stuff. And of course, put your comments and your suggestions in the comment section below. I really appreciate it when you do so. And that's going to be it. Stay healthy, stay safe, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye. Where's the remote control for the camera? Ah, here it is.